record my comments. Okay, it is my great pleasure to introduce once again our uh, dear friend, Paul Anderson, who owns and operates the historic Anderson Ferry. You know, we've had Paul here once before in just the last few years to tell us about, well, no, he didn't come here. We came to him. We had um, a tent meeting and uh, had dedicated a, had a marker. Music. Huh? Dedicated a marker. Dedicated a marker, had music, had all kinds of events to celebrate the Anderson Ferry. And um, we've asked Paul this time to reminisce about, you know, he's, he's operated the ferry for 33 years, a long time, and he's seen all kinds of changes, I'm sure. We've asked him to think about those changes and tell us about anything he thinks of about the ferry that he wants us to know and realize. You know, you don't know about these things until you get from the source, you know? So he's, uh, he's come and, and uh, agreed to speak to us tonight. We want to know if, if the river is changing because of the climate, as well as anything else. You can tell us. And thank you for coming. Let's give him an applause. Thank you, Bessie. Thanks to everybody for coming out tonight. Bessie asked me some time back, I think this is on. It is. It is. Yeah. Uh, if I would speak, and when she first uh, approached me, I thought, well, uh, she wants me to talk about the ferry. But then a little while later, she had called and said, well, she'd rather I talk more about the Ohio River and the, uh, the history of the river. And I kind of got carried away. I was supposed to speak about a year ago, and I had to postpone it. And I didn't think it would be this long before I got here. But it's given me a lot of time to do a lot of research. And if you stop and think about it, uh, you know, there's so many aspects of the Ohio River, and I tried to touch on the important ones. And you can take any one of these and just talk and talk and talk about it. And there's so much interesting things. And some of it might be uh, pretty factual and, uh, you know, things like that. But uh, I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you all get something out of it. I think you'll take something away. I need to thank my wife, Debbie, and uh, she keeps me from running in the ditch all the time. <laughs> and uh, she helped create this uh, slide uh, PowerPoint. Uh, her and Justin, our son, and uh, it kind of coordinates with everything pretty well. I know when you walk in a room and you see an old guy sitting down, you don't know if he's long-winded or just unstable. <laughs> We're going to find out here directly. <laughs> I'll let you choose. <laughs> but uh, I want to start out, I go all the way back as far as recorded history can tell you. And uh, it goes back to the glacier period. And that's the kind of drawing that I have up there. That's what they call the Taze River. It started over in West Virginia or Virginia and it came westward and then it kind of broke off and went a little bit to the south and went more of a northwesterly direction up through Ohio, Indiana and over in Illinois. And at one time, South Central Ohio was completely covered with water. And where we are now, the glacier ice was one mile deep. I mean, some of these things I found out I couldn't hardly believe. It. And the ice held back the water many years and then as it, the recession of the Wisconsin Glacier allowed the water to uh, spill over and run into a south westerly direction along Kentucky there and uh, the spill in Britannica.com says the spill was actually near today's location of Anderson Ferry. <laughs> Now that's the last time you'll hear me plug Anderson Ferry. <laughs> but, but I thought that was really interesting. <laughs> I didn't know that. The next slide, that shows the Ohio River from Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, all the way down as it is today. 
to uh, Chicago, Illinois. But the Taze River is still in existence today because there's great aquifer of water underground under Boone County, Carroll County, parts of Ohio, Indiana. And it's pure water. It's 450 feet down in most cases. And there's a brewery in Lafayette, Indiana called the Taze Brewing Company. And they make beer. And they pump this Taze water out of the ground and they process it and make, make a, a beer. The, the water has never been exposed to modern pollution of modern man. So it's some of the purest water that could be found. In the, in the way of talking about rivers in general and specifically the Ohio River, uh, the shortest river in the United States is only 210 feet long. I was surprised to hear that. It's in Great Falls, Montana. It connects the Missouri River to Crystal Lake. It's only 210 feet long. It's not you know, just a little over half as long as a football field. And the longest river in the world, or in the United States, is uh, 2,202 miles long. And that's the Missouri River. The Ohio River is the tenth longest river in the United States. It's formed by the Allegheny and the Monongahela River in Pittsburgh, and that empties into the Mississippi River, Cairo. It drops 429 feet in elevation, going 981 miles. Of course, today it's all like, you know, steps in a sidewalk. Every time you get to a lock and dam, it'll take you down so many feet. And in the whole process, there's 20 dams. It'll take you down 429 feet if you go the, the whole length of the river. The original depth of the river was maybe as shallow as three feet and as much as 20 feet. In some places you could cross, not even get your feet wet, the dry time of the year. Today the widest place in the Ohio River is at Smithland, Kentucky. It's one mile wide. And it narrows up at the upper end to 700 feet. The river's deepest spot is at Louisville, Kentucky. It's 132 feet. There's 20 dams and 38 generating power plants along the length of the river. The river borders six states, Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, Kentucky, Indiana, and Illinois. It has 160 plus species of fish, and it's home to many species of birds and other wildlife. The river provides drainage to 15 different states, or parts thereof, and there's more than 25 million people that live in the Ohio River Basin, which is, that's the drainage area and the river basin there, depicted on the map. The Ohio River is the largest volume by water tributary to the Mississippi River. And the largest <coughs> tributary to the Ohio River would be the Tennessee River. <coughs> Other tributaries include the Cumberland, Kanawha, Big Sandy, Licking, Kentucky Green, Muskegon, Miami, Wabash, and Scioto Rivers. Major cities along the river, Pittsburgh, East Liverpool, Wheeling, Parkersburg, Huntington, Ashland, Cincinnati, Louisville, Owensboro, Evansville, Henderson, and Paducah. And then here's a not so wanted to hear statistic, but the Ohio River is the most polluted river in the United States. That's a looking up river at the McAlpine Lock down low. The uh, locks and the dam on the right side there is where they had to build a canal to go around the falls of the Ohio. The falls of the Ohio would be on the left side. The actual original channel of the river would be the left the stream on the left side. So I'll get the picture of that directly. That's an illustration of one of the power plants along the river. 
Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Indians, the Native Americans. For hundreds of years, the Native Americans uh, hunted and fished and traveled the entire length of the Ohio River. The Iroquois called the River Ohio, meaning the Great River. One of the first Europeans to see the river was La Salle in 1669. He named the river La Bella Riviere, meaning the beautiful river. And on June the 15th, 1749, a party of French and Indians from La Chine, which is on the St. Lawrence River, headed for the Ohio country to establish French authority. There was a group of 246 people, which included Father Jean Bonacamp, who was a Jesuit mathematician and cartographer. And uh, he, he made a map and kept journals and they're the first known journals are recorded uh, uh, in the history, in the way of history of the Ohio River. Also in 1749, Great Britain established the Ohio River Company. It's the same year. They wanted to settle and trade in the same area as the French. And this led to a conflict which led to the French and Indian War. <coughs> This, by the way, is Chief Cornstalks. Uh, he was the chief of the Shawnee Nation. Uh, by signing a treaty in, in 1763, the English gained control of the entire territory and ended the French and Indian War. In 1763, England also issued a proclamation telling people not to move or settle west of the Appalachian Mountains. And then five years later, in 68, 1768, England made a treaty with the Iroquois and the Cherokee for English settlements southeast of the Ohio River. This excluded Ohio and Indiana, which was considered the Northwest Territory. But this treaty was not honored by the Shawnee and the Mingo Indians. And they were defeated. They had a battle with the, uh, there was a battle at Point Pleasant which uh, is up across from uh, where the Kanawha River comes into the Ohio. And the Indians were defeated. And uh, the Native Americans, Indians in the area included the Rapi, the Uri, the, the Shawnee, the Munsky, Cherokee, Chickasaw, Miami, Mingo, several other tribes. Many Native American people of the Ohio Valley experienced massive illness and death. Before the Europeans arrived, many others died from smallpox and other diseases that they brought when they came over, the Europeans. In the end, many were forcibly uprooted and marched to Oklahoma and other territories out in the West. Now, Chief Carnstock, after the battle, the Point Pleasant, he wanted to uh, have peace. He, was a, he wanted to have peace before the battle, and after they were defeated, he wanted even more to have peace. He went to the, this Fort Randolph in uh, what was then Virginia, today it's West Virginia, which is on the, at the mouth of where the Kanawha River comes into the Ohio. But him and his son and two companions were in the fort, and I guess apparently, the way I read it, they must have spent more than, you know, a couple of days there. But while they were there, they were all four murdered by soldiers in the fort. And the way I understand, too, uh, there was a big outrage over it, but uh, nobody was prosecuted or brought to justice for what happened. But because of this, the Shawnee uh, raided and, you know, uh, they were upset. So they, they uh, raided a lot of villages and towns and maybe otherwise, you know, a lot of people's lives. But uh, by the end of the uh, American Revolution, settlers pushed west across the Appalachian Mountains. And uh, like Steve was saying a little bit ago, the Ohio River was like our I-75 today. I mean, that was their way of transportation. And they uh, brought their families and belongings westward as they came. And in the 1800s, the Ohio River became a commercial route for farmers and manufacturers. They moved their goods on flatboats and barges downstream to New Orleans. At that point, they could load them onto ocean vessels and deliver them to the eastern seaports. 
their biggest obstacle was the falls of the Ohio, which is what I was talking about a while ago. Unless the river was high, you'd take your boat down to the falls and you had to unload everything and take it by wagon past the falls and reload it on another boat and go on down. And then the vessels uh, overcame that in 1830 by building the, they built a canal around the falls and the canal was built by the Louisville and Kentucky Canal Company. It cost $750,000 and they charged the toll until 1855 when the federal government took it over which was just before the Civil War. But even still, it was faster to take their goods down to New Orleans and bring them around to the eastern seaports than to try and take them by horse and wagon back over the Appalachian Mountains. That's another, that's looking down river at the McAlpine Locks down there on the left, and that's part of the, what would have been the original falls of the Ohio there. I had an illustration of different boats here. Of course, the canoe was used by the Native Americans, also by the European explorers and trappers. The canoe was like 12 to 24 feet long. Sometimes they had real long canoes, 40 or 50 feet long. They were most all made of birch bark, and uh, some of them were had, they had logs that were actually hollowed out and made into a canoe for heavier supplies. The settlers used flat boats to get around. And then they had the barges and keel boats. That would be a keel boat. That would be like the boat that Lewis and Clark had in 1804 when they went down the river. Uh, the boats were all propelled by long oars and poles that they pushed against the river bottoms. And then they had a wide uh, bladed uh, sweep on the back to use to help steer the boat. Long canoes were called galleys, and they, they were used to move large numbers of soldiers <coughs> long, in long distances. The Ark was a very large <coughs> uh, barge built of heavier material. They were 20, and 20 feet wide and 4 feet deep, 50 feet long. Uh, once they got down river, they usually took them apart and sold the material or used it to build a house. Uh, barges traveling from Cincinnati to New Orleans in about five weeks. The ones that they could, that were lighter, that they could try to get back up the river would take as much as 12 weeks to get back up the river. <coughs> the keel boats had 12 or 10 hands and a master. They carried 20 or 30 tons. The barges had 40 or 50 men, and they carried 50 and 60 tons. They all the boats had a mast and a square sail, ropes and provisions. In 1794, the U.S. mail started using the Ohio River to deliver mail, and they used small boats, 24 foot long, like these. They're referred to as like the whaling boats when they use them in the ocean to kill whales. And uh, they had four oarsmen and a steersman, like that. And they go as far as uh, 60 miles downriver in a day and maybe 30 miles upriver. Most of these uh, people would not travel by night because it was pretty treacherous trying to travel at night with no light. In uh, 1801, the Navigator came out as a small chart pamphlet. It was created by Zadok Kramer it was a navigator and almanac that went on sale on Market Street in Pittsburgh for a dollar. It gave settlers that wanted to go down the river an idea of what to expect around each bend. It mapped out the river and told what villages and towns, how far they had gone as they go along. Um, and it was really, uh, for its time, it was really an accurate account. 
and a lot of people it's in my reading have said that several people tried to copy what he had done and sell their own you know pamphlet but uh, his was probably the most original accurate map that they had at that time after the Revolutionary War there was tremendous growth in the southeastern United States in 1803 the Louisiana Purchase gave the port of New Orleans to the United States 1769 a Scotsman named James Watt invented an engine that ran on steam. In 1787, John Fitch built a boat in the United States that was powered by steam. He sailed it down the Delaware River. And Fitch built four more steamboats, but his design made them very expensive to operate. And in 1807, Robert Fulton built the Claremont. That's Robert Fulton. He died when he died. He was only 48 or 49 when he died. But he built, a, he and a friend of his, Robert Livingston, who was a congressman, I believe. His name, I think, is on the Declaration of Independence. He had political clout and influence. And when Fulton and Livingston built their first steamboat and went down the river, they also, as they went by, they, they uh, through uh, each state, they gained the uh, we call it like a monopoly. They had nobody else could haul anything on a steamboat. If they made a steamboat, which they did for several years, everybody had to pay Livingston and Fulton a fee, you know, for using their idea to carry goods. Of course, the big thing about the steamboat was when you got down river, you could turn around and go back up the river, and you didn't require as much labor, so many people. But. Uh, the Claremont was their first successful boat. They took it up on the Hudson River and they went from New York to Albany, which was 40 miles in 1811. Uh, in 18, actually, that was eight, yeah, 1807. But in 1811, Fulton and Livingston built the boat called the New Orleans. That's the Claremont, the first one they had on Hudson River. And this would be the New Orleans. So they built them in, they had a shipyard in Pennsylvania. It was a side wheeler, it had two masts, it had a hundred ton capacity. She was the first steamboat on Western rivers. In January of 1812, the New Orleans left Pittsburgh, traveling more than 2,000 miles to New Orleans, Louisiana. It was piloted by Captain Nicholas Roosevelt. That's him and his wife and one of his children. He was a boiler maker by trade, and he was the great great uncle of Theodore Roosevelt, the president. And Henry Shreve piloted the Enterprise down the river to New Orleans in 1814, which was two years later. And while he was in New Orleans, he helped General Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans by running supplies past the enemy shore batteries. He was also the first person to take a steamboat upriver from New Orleans to Pittsburgh. In 1824, he built the George Washington in Cincinnati, Ohio. And the George Washington was a uh, larger type of steamboat from the ones I showed you, and it's more like today's version of a steamboat had the upper deck passenger cabins and uh, a lot of the boat builders and designers after Shreve would design their boats the way he did. He also designed in 1829 he designed that was the Enterprise I should have moved up there quicker that was the boat he took down and brought back <coughs> up. That's a snag boat dredge like the one he built 1829, he built a snag boat called the Helpless. In 1835, he settled in Shreveport, Louisiana. That's the town was named after him. Steamboats all used wood as fuel until the 1830s when coal became more readily available and cheaper. 
by 1850, a mixture of wood and coal were used. By 1880, coal was almost entirely replaced, had replaced wood. Today, steamboats use a thick oil to burn to create the steam. Some steamboats were side wheelers, some were stern wheelers, uh, some boats were, that's another, uh, like a derrick type boat, lift snags out of the way. That would be like a push boat, tow boat to push barges. That would be a uh, packet boat because it's loaded down with cotton. Some were used to haul cotton and other supplies and farm products. Some were used as to push showboats from town to town to, for entertainment for the different towns. Some steamboats uh, were used for ferry boats, take people and animals across the river. Uh, some steamboats were used just to take fuel and supplies out to the channel to meet other boats to re stock whatever they needed from the bank. They were called uh, fueler boats or supply boats. Uh, all of these early steamboats, or a lot of them, had the misfortune of having accidents uh, with their boilers blowing up. That's just uh, another example of a tow boat and spray. Then you have the, another example of an excursion boat and a pack of both combination. There's the, not Natchez, that's the early Natchez. That's the boat that raced against the Robert E. Lee there in the middle. The great race, Robert E. Lee and the Natchez. The Robert E. Lee won. And uh, that's just another example of an excursion boat. There's one of the views of the wheelhouse. That's another one in the winter time where they got the stove and the spit tune there. <laughs> oh, this is an example of how the boiler could explode. This is a depiction of the Sultania, which exploded. <coughs> it was licensed or certified to carry 326 people, and they had almost 2,500 people on there. They were bringing soldiers, and it was right after the Civil War, and they were bringing soldiers up the river and it exploded, and most of them died. It was the, more people died than on the Titanic, and it's still the uh, worst maritime disaster in American history at this time. But your steam boiler, your valves could have a problem and stick, and your steam, your seam might rupture in your boiler. I mean, there's all kinds of different little parts that can cause the pressure to overbuild and explode. And uh, in 1852, they passed a law where all boats had to have safety inspections. And uh, the boats, the pallets, and the engineers were also required to be licensed. Railroads became competition to the steamboat in the early 1830s. The steamboats were still used into the mid-1900s. Eventually, the diesel engine replaced the steam engine. In 1847, flatboat traffic peaked with 2,792 flatboats arriving in New Orleans. In 1852, more than 8,000 steamboat stops were documented in Cincinnati, which is an average of one per hour. It's a lot of traffic. And a dark time in our history would be, that's the Cincinnati waterfront, 1865 would be the slavery period. Uh, the Ohio River was important because it was a dividing line between the North and the South. Many slaves crossed the river to seek their freedom. Uh, many lost their lives trying to get across the river. Many were captured and returned. Uh, some tried to escape on their own. Some had help from the Underground Railroad. Sometimes a small a person with a small boat or a ferry boat would help them across. 
uh, when the river was frozen, they tried to walk across uh, a slave, and just because you got across and you were in the north, if you didn't have proper papers, you could be captured by a U.S. Marshal or a bounty hunter. And a lot of them saw actual freedom by going all the way to Canada. And I thought this was interesting. More than 100,000 ex-slaves fought for the Union Army in the Civil War. And I got a section on the canals. There was a period that built several canals. The construction of the Erie, the Ohio and Erie Canal started in 1825 and finished in 1832. It went from Cleveland to Portsmouth a distance of 308 miles, and then the cities were only 80 hours apart. The Miami and Erie Canal ran from Cincinnati to Toledo, Ohio, a total of 248 miles. This canal was opened in 1845. The Cincinnati Whitewater Canal <coughs> opened in 1845, or 1843. It took a northwest direction from Cincinnati across the Great Miami River and uh, joined the uh, Whitewater Canal above Cleves, Ohio. But uh, a lot of uh, several years of high water, serious flooding, and the railroad uh, competition uh, kind of wiped it out as being a profitable business. But between the railroads and the canals, it made for faster and cheaper. Uh, travel and it helped greatly to settle mid America and further west. This is a more modern picture of a canal boat. I wanted to say a little bit about shanty boats. In the uh, late 1800s, shanty boats became common on the Ohio River. They were long and narrow with two to three rooms. Many families who could not find or could not afford permanent housing resorted to living on shanty boats. By 1900, there were about 50,000 shanty boats on the Ohio and Mississippi River. But the flood of 1937 destroyed a lot of these boats, and by 1950, there were not very many. All but disappeared. And then I want to get into the Civil War era. Uh, the Ohio River was a main supply line for the Union Army during the Civil War. The river uh, was considered a lot more dependable than a railroad to move troops and supplies. The Tennessee and the Cumberland River was important for mobilizing troops. Many river cities worked hard to provide warships and military supplies. USS Cincinnati, which is this boat here, the USS Cincinnati was built in 1861 under a, a War Department contract. She participated in the, uh, the attack and capture of Fort Henry in 1862 on the Tennessee River in Middle Tennessee. The USS Cincinnati fired the first shot and was repeatedly rammed until she sank. And this was considered to be Ulysses S. Grant's first important victory in the Western Theater. The USS Cincinnati was then raised and returned to service in May of 1863. She was then ordered to sail down the Mississippi River to take out Confederate guns at the Siege of Vicksburg. But the Confederate cannons was high on the bluff, way up at high. So when the boats would go by, the cannons, instead of the cannons being going like this, they'd be going raining down, straight down. So the cannon came through the uh, USS Cincinnati, went all the way through the hall, and it caused her to start taking on water real quickly. So the crew ran her towards the bank for shallow water, you know. And when it sank, uh, she, she was able to be raised again, which was in August of 1863. She finished out the war, the Civil War, in Mobile Bay as a patrol boat until August of 65, and she was sold and dismantled in March of 1866 in New Orleans. At the end of the Civil War, there was more than 100,000 men and 10,000 horses taken to Parkersburg, West Virginia, over the Baltimore-Ohio Railroad. 
They were transported down the Ohio River by steamboat to be mustered out in various cities along the way. More than 92 steamboats were used. The first bridge to span the Ohio River was the Wheeling, West Virginia Suspension Bridge. That's a painting or depiction. Charles Ellett Jr. designed and supervised the construction of the bridge, which opened in 1849. That's a modern photograph. Before the Civil War, in September 1856, work began on the uh, John A. Roebling Suspension Bridge to connect Cincinnati and Covington. But construction halted when they had rumors of the Civil War, rumors of war. So nothing was done again for a while. Well, the bridge construction didn't resume until after the war. But in June 1862, the Union Army built a pontoon bridge across the river right next to the bridge pier on the Ohio side to transport the military and their supplies uh, to Northern Kentucky. Uh, to build fortifications in the event of a Confederate attack. In uh, 1867, the suspension bridge was completed. It was built at a cost of $1,800,000. The first railroad bridge across the Ohio was the Louisville National Railroad Bridge connecting Cincinnati and Newport, Kentucky. The first train across this bridge was March the 9th, 1872. The bridge cost $3 million. It was the only bridge out of Cincinnati that allowed pedestrians, wagons, streetcars, and trains. The day we know this bridge is the Purple People. The next bridge was the Southern Railroad Bridge between Cincinnati and Ludlow, Kentucky, which finished 1877 at a cost of $1 million. And today there's more than 80 railroad and highway bridges and five ferry boats on the Ohio River. The Corps of Engineers began in, in 1775 under George Washington to provide military engineers. In 1838, a division was created to supervise coastal fortification, build lighthouses, map navigation channels, and U.S. rivers, and to map much of the American West. After the Civil War, the U.S. government was interested in the waterway improvement. They began to build larger boats, snag boats, dredge boats, and in addition, the banks were marked. Each band would have a uh, lighted marker or just a day marker. You can tell which way the river is turning because one would be green or one would be red. But uh, the U.S. Coast Guard assumed the control of these aids to navigation after World War II. The, uh, a lot of people here may remember before they built the modern dams in the early 60s. They had the older locks and dams. They were called wicked dams. They had panels that laid down. They had concrete slabs on the bottom and they had hinged panels made out of four by four posts. They were about four feet wide, 18 feet tall. They'd have to take a boat out there with a derrick and lift it up. And it had one of lift up, it would have like this, it would have a pin fall back down like this to hold it up. And that would hold the water back and make it deep enough for larger boats to go through the lock on, on the bank side. But in 1874, movable dams, which they were considered, was well, they were designed by Jacques Chanin. In eight, and in 1852, they were introduced for canaling in the Ohio River to maintain the water depth for heavy barges. In 1929, there was 53 such dams from Pittsburgh to Cairo, Illinois. During World War II, more than a thousand military vessels were built 
in shipyards along the Ohio River. After World War II, the diesel towboat, having more horsepower and greater load capacity, meant an end for the steamboats. Larger tows also created a need for larger dams. And in 1953, 62 million tons of cargo was removed on the Ohio River. This was twice the amount that was passed through the Panama Canal at that time. This, that was the Paul G. Blazer. Uh, it's a marathon boat. That's the a steel leader. That's a powerhouse inside. The powerhouse is a steel leader. Of course, that's a Delta Queen steamboat of today. Of course, you know, it's retired. I say a steamboat of today, but they're refurbishing it, rebuilding it to make it more fireproof or more more friendly. And if they're going to bring it back in a couple of years, it'll be back on the river. And so, do you know who that is? President Jimmy Carter playing the Calliope on the Delta Queen. <laughs> I got a kick out of that. Uh, but today, modern locks and dams help to regulate the river's uh, levels also. Uh, not quite as horrific of flooding today as there used to be. I'm not saying they can't happen, but they do, they do a lot to control it. Also, they have many levees and flood walls along many towns and communities to help hold back the water. And tributaries upriver, they've made huge reservoirs to help hold the water. Uh, as it builds up, you know, they can hold it back so it doesn't all come down at once, and then they kind of release it and let it go a little at a time. That's all helped with the, with the river flooding. And the highest river levels we ever had here is 1884 was 71.1, 1913 was 70 feet, 1937 was 80 feet. This is a picture of the suspension bridge when it was 80 feet and 37. And ice has always been a problem uh, in your upper, especially your upper parts of your rivers. There's a 1918 ice picture in Cincinnati. But uh, the first ice recorded on the Ohio River to affect navigation was the 9th of December, 1857. The best chance for ice is from December the 1st uh, through uh, the first week of March. Since 1874, the ice has appeared in Cincinnati 69% of all winters, which is close to about two-thirds of all winters. The government's built many icebreakers along the river. It helps break up the ice, and it gives, also gives uh, uh, boats a place to kind of get in behind and shield themselves so the ice doesn't carry them away. Uh, the river ice can be thin, and sometimes, I mean real thin, and sometimes it can be very thick, and that's when it's the most damaging. When, uh, when we get a lot of ice in the river, we take the ferry boat across the river to the Ohio side because there's a bend in the river. And uh, when the ice starts coming down the river in large, heavy amounts, it will push up on the Kentucky bank there. And if the ferry boats was there, they just push the boats up on the bank or rip them off and carry them downstream. But ice is pretty uh, serious stuff. Uh, today, I'm all the way up to the day now. <laughs> today, there's more than uh, 184 million tons moved on the Ohio River each year. In 2014, the local port district was expanded. This is not that many years ago five years ago. They expanded the port, the port district from 26 miles to 226 and a half mile of Ohio River and seven miles up the Ligon River, which includes 15 counties. Uh, this has all brought an awareness to our region as a global origin and destination for river commerce. 
Today, the Port of Greater Cincinnati Development Authority and Northern Kentucky Port Authority make this the busiest in the port district in the nation. And I mean, that's saying something if you're the busiest inland port in the whole country. Also, the region's port district ranks 13th on a list of the nation's top ports. But to address these challenges and to give support to individual businesses making up the river industry, uh, the Central Ohio Bus River Business Association was formed, which uh, they call CORP, short for Central Ohio River Business Association. But their, their, their mission statement is to unite river businesses and industry to speak with a common voice in promoting commerce, safety, security, as well as environmental stewardship. That's the Panama Canal. And from 2011 to 2016, they made the Panama Canal deeper, I don't, I don't know how deep, and they made it 30% uh, wider. They had two lanes, now they got three lanes. So they can, they don't back up as much, the traffic doesn't have to stop and wait as long, they get more through at a time. But as a result of enlarging the Panama Canal, I believe, this is my personal opinion, that the Ohio River will become even busier in the future and create a, probably a need for a deeper channel for deeper barges or larger boats. And I think to do that, they'll, and they'll end up probably raising the pool stages three and four feet or so to make it deeper. So, the, uh, 